Okay, 1 Peter chapter 5. Let me go ahead and read verses 1 through 4 again. This is part 2 of, of our study. Uh, we last left off a couple of weeks ago because of Mother's Day. And so now we'll get right back to it. Peter says in chapter 5, verse 1, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Then he instructs and says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Serve as overseers, not by constraint, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, that is Jesus Christ, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And so we left off basically at the first statement. There are the elders which are among you, I exhort. Uh, we didn't get very far, did we? And so we left off with who, is, who can become an elder and what is the requirements of an elder. And so I want to just read to you uh, an area in Paul's letter to Timothy on the qualifications of an elder. And we're talking on that theme. And the reason that we're spending so much time here is, is because we all, as believers, have to deal with those in leadership. We just have to. If you are a believer and that you are actively serving in the church or in ministry, you have to deal with leadership. And there's a responsibility on, on your part and on my part, and on my part towards you too. If you are a believer and you really are not serving, I encourage you to get involved and, and serve in some capacity, whether it's here or somewhere else, but you still have to deal with leadership. You still have to go to a ministry, a church, and you still have to listen to the leadership there within that ministry. The pastor who is teaching uh, the elders and running various ministries, if you go to a singles ministry, a couples ministry, uh, there will always be leadership that we need to uh, submit ourselves to. And so we need to understand the quality of that leadership, the character of that leadership as we approach it uh, one another. Obviously, Jesus told the disciples that they will know that you are my disciples by the hate you have for one another? No. By the love that you have for one another. That is the outside world, unbelievers, when they see you, your family, your members, your neighbors, your friends that don't know Jesus Christ, when they see you and your relationship with other believers, they will know that you know Jesus Christ. Because those relationships are based upon the word of God, the truth of God, in the love of God, that you are willing to love one another. And really, that's the whole purpose here, is for us to love one another so that we can reflect Christ's love uh, to the world, the dying world. So uh, let's look at Timothy. Let's turn left in your Bibles there, a couple of letters over, to First Timothy. And I just want to read this to you. I'm not going to exhaust it because there's so much that I want to still talk about. I'm hoping to get done today with this section, but in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, Paul gives us the qualifications of elders and also deacons within the church. There's a government to the church. Now, we don't like the word government, you know, but we use that word government to talk about leadership within the body of Christ. Ultimately, Jesus is our leader. Paul tells us that in Corinthians. He's the head of us all, and then we are at my point in myself, priests, elders, pastors, assistants, and so forth, are under shepherds. In other words, we're under Christ, and he's our leader, and we're leading under him. And then from there, you have your elders and your deacons, depending on, uh, on the gifts of the Spirit that have been given to those individual men, whether they can teach or administrate. Maybe there's elders or pastors that are really good at administrating things, you know, getting things done and so forth. And so Paul is setting in order, as we spoke last time, there are churches raising up all over the place, and so Paul is encouraging these churches to raise up good leadership, raise up faithful men. We see that in the book of Acts, chapter 2. We're to look for faithful men, and you need to be faithful, or you need to be committed. You need to have a deep relationship with Jesus Christ, because ministry can be Horrific at times. It can be difficult because of the expectations, because of the requirements, uh, because of the hours and the commitment and the denial of self. A lot of denying of self and, and of your own time. And it takes work in order to be a good leader. And that's what um, 
the book of Acts, Luke was sharing concerning leadership. When you look for leadership, you look for faithful men. You look for men that are filled with the Holy Spirit, men that are separated unto God and saying, Lord, here I am like Isaiah, use me. I want to be used by you. They understand the fears, they understand the struggles, they don't like them, they don't like to be put in certain situations, but there's something in them that just says, Lord, here I am, use me. Uh, I can't go anywhere else unless I'm used by you, Lord. And those are the type of men that we need to find. And Paul gives us the qualifications of these men. He says in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, verse 1, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop or a pastor or an elder, we can, we can switch that word with that word, he desires a good work. So it's a good thing if you desire that. There's nothing wrong with it. A bishop then must be blameless, the word blameless there is not necessarily perfect. It's more, it's more irreproachable. Uh, you should be able to approach him, and he should be willing to serve and to help you in the situation. The husband of one wife, so he can't have two wives. Uh, some have suggested that this means uh, he can't be divorced. That's not what it's saying. He just needs to have one wife and have a relationship with that wife. Temperate, um, basically that means uh, able to abstain from drink. You know, he's not involved with drinking and so forth. Sober-minded, um, in other words, has a sound mind, you know, can reason a little bit, you know, and doesn't make foolish uh, decisions and so forth. Good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, that is his own family, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And that makes sense. If you can't even rule your own house, how are you going to rule within the church of God? Oftentimes you will find pastors, um, children involved in ministry. And if you go to many of the Calvaries, you will definitely find the senior pastor and probably his sons and his daughters doing children ministries or youth ministries. Uh, Roman just came back and was sharing about uh, a ch Calvary and Havasu and how it was a father and the son was an assistant pastor you know, there in the ministry. And that happens very often. You see it with Chuck. You see it with Rawl. You see it with a lot of these pastors because it passed on. Why? Because they've raised their household up very well to the point where they become ministers and pastors and so forth. Dobson was third generation pastor. And his son, I believe, is a pastor uh, also. So fourth generation has gone on. I, I remember hearing a comment from an individual that I'm not sure if he's a pastor or not. Some have called him a pastor. but uh, And there's a lot of other things that I've seen about him on, on Facebook. So like he's smoking now you know, in front of people, putting it on Facebook. So I'm about ready to delete him um, off of there. But he was saying that, uh, he said, one problem with the church is that they have this, this hierarchy, controlling attitude where they pass the ministry on from the, the, the pastor to their son. And, and that is just worldly. And, and I'm thinking, where does he get that from? Because every time I read in Scripture, where are ministries passed to? Moses passed it on to Aaron and to his sister. You know, God didn't call on us, he called on his son to die on the cross for the world. And so you see this, this, this principle take place where those that are godly and raising up godly families, they're passing it on because there's no one else worthy uh, to fit the description there. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, but we do. You know, we do. There are people out there that are worthy and they start ministries and they do get involved. And that's not the general attitude of just choosing a son just because he's a son. No, he has to be anointed too. We see Pastor Chuck, who passed away, um, giving it over not to his son, but to his son-in-law. And now Brian Broderson is, is the head of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. So I disagree with that. I think it's very biblical, and there's those, those times where that does happen. And it's okay, because they've raised their families well, as Paul said they should. He also says, not a novice, so in other words, not someone young, uh, at least being puffed up with pride, that means conceited, Oftentimes people come in here and they, they know exactly what to do. I had a guy years ago come in and he sat there and um, after the, the message and so forth, he came up and he said, that was okay. That was okay. I mean, I, I could do better. You know, I've, 
and, and he begins to tell me how he went to this Christian university and he got his doctorate and his PhD. And he said, I could basically take this church and just really flourish it with my expertise and knowledge. You know, and I looked at him and I says, wow. I says, I, I'll bet that you probably can. And I'll bet that you're probably smarter than me and probably even a better teacher. And, and I bet that you probably have better skills and better, uh, you know, s- vocabulary and so forth. I bet you have all of that. And I don't even argue the fact. But here's the difference. God called me here. He didn't call you. So thanks for the information. <laughs> you know, God called me here. You know, he called me the way I am, with the flaws I have, with the lack of education, with the lack of speaking, with all those things that he said I didn't have and he had, you know, to be here. And I said, if you want, go start a church and God bless you. Boy, I hope it's great, you know, wherever you go and so forth. So, so there are those that are they're in ministry and they're conceited. They're God's gift, you know, to mankind and self and so forth. So you need to be careful with those who are always up here, and I did this, and I did that, and I can do this, and I can overcome this, and we'll make this church grow. You know, that's up to God, right? We water, and we plant seeds, and God gives the increase. And so be careful with those who are raised up in pride. Uh, He falls into various combinations, as the devil did. And so he gives us this list. We'll stop there. So you get the idea that there are some qualifications for uh, a pastor, biblical qualifications that he needs to meet in order to be in that situation. Now, Peter exhorts the elders back to chapter 5, and we're going to go in, into the next statement where he says, I am a fellow elder. And he exhorts the elders here now. Uh, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Let me stop there. Notice that Peter is, is putting himself on the same plane as the other elders. Now, now he's an apostle, definitely. He walked with Jesus, definitely. He did miracles, yeah. He saw miracles. He saw the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Definitely, he's an apostle along with the other 11 apostles. You know, there's no argument there. But here, he's talking to the churches. And as he's talking to the churches, he's telling them, I'm just like you. I'm also an elder and responsible to do these things that I'm about ready to share with you, tend the sheep, feed them, and take care of them. And so I'm on the same plane as you are. I'm not any different. I'm a man, you know, with blood and flesh. You know, I feel, uh, I get hurt, you know, you, you pinch me, I'll go, ow, you know, you poke me, and I'll go, why'd you do that? You know, I'm just like you, is what he's saying here. If he was someone special, he would have said, I am not like you. God has put me in a position that is higher than yours. And so I have authority over you to direct you in new doctrines, in new procedures, you know, in in new covenants and sacraments and various things. He didn't say that, though. And when you read Scripture, there is nowhere in Scripture where God has put a man over other men in that type of situation where new revelation, new understanding is come about by him. The only person that is above Peter, above the apostles, above elders, is Jesus, God. And he won't even violate uh, his word because what is written is written and it's in concrete, it's sealed. He can't add to it. And so for someone to come along and say, I am above all these things. What point am I trying to make here? This is the point that I'm trying to make, is that Peter is not the first pope, as the Catholic Church has said. <clears throat> they, they look at Peter and they say, he is our first pope because Jesus said, the gates of hell should not prevail against you. Because Jesus called him the rock. Actually, when you look at it in the Greek, Jesus told him, I'm the rock, you're the pebble. (laughs) That's what he really said in the Greek when you look at it. Now, I say that because it's what Scripture teaches us. And if you are interested in knowing the truth and really want to understand it, you need to do your research. You need to do your research because you need to understand truth and you need to know what you believe in. I'm not against Catholicism. I was raised and born in Catholicism. It, it laid my foundation. 
It helped me make a decision for Christ, actually. I think without it, I might not have made that decision. But the fact that I believe that Jesus was God, I believe that Jesus was a part of the Trinity, I believe that he was a savior of the world, which are things that Catholicism teaches us. But there are things that they teach us that are not biblical. They're not in the Word of God. You can't find them. And when I started to read the Word of God, I started to realize, boy, I, I, I thought that was the truth. It wasn't. It's just one of their um, doctrines that they've came up. Their sacraments are new revelation. And so it is their interpretation. Do you know that the Pope today has the ability to, to write and add to the scriptures if he feels that God is telling him to do so. He just came out, the new pope just came out and said that there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. Used to be that way, and then it, it, it kind of uh, stopped where they were saying, no, we can encompass other religions and so forth and bring them in and, and they can also be saved. But this pope here has come out and said there is no salvation other than through the Catholic Church. That's not true. Jesus said there's no salvation other but through me. You know, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one can go to the Father except through me. He didn't say except through the Catholic Church. Catholicism, he said through me. And so salvation comes only through Jesus Christ for anyone that wants to come to him, whether you're Catholic, Baptist, Lutheran, doesn't matter. Those are just titles and organizations. What he wants is your heart. He wants you personally. And he wants to have that personal relationship with you. And what Peter is saying here is, I understand you. I'm just like you. I'm no different than you are. I'm not above you. I understand the persecution that you're going through. In fact, I will be persecuted. And we know that Peter later on down the road will be uh, crucified upside down because he felt so unworthy to be even crucified as the Lord was. And so we see this observation where Peter suggests that, that he's not literally um, speaking down to them as less or superior uh, individuals, but he's on the same plane addressing them as equals in this relationship. And of course, Peter was given this commission by the risen Lord to feed the sheep, to tend to the flock, and we see that in John, right? Ch chapter 21, verse 5 and on after Peter had denied the Lord three times, and he decided that he was going to quit and go back to fishing. And so there he was at the lake, and he was fishing, and Jesus came, and he waited and prepared a you know, nice little fire, and they brought some fish in, and they had some breakfast and so forth. And Jesus begins to speak to Peter. He goes to Peter, and he ministers to Peter. Uh, here Peter denies him. Here Peter rejects him in front of people, a witness, backslides, and yet Jesus goes to him. And says, I'm still going to use you. See, and that's our God. He, he loves us. So whatever you've done, whatever you think is bad enough that God would reject you, it's not. God's arms are always open to you. And he's always willing to accept you back into the fold if you're willing. In fact, he's coming to you and saying, come back. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. And that's what he's going to tell Peter here. So I have a plan and a purpose. Yo, I know you denied me. And you confess that. And I receive that confession and I forgive you of that. And so now come and serve with me. Serve with me together. And this is what Jesus told Peter. Verse 15 of John chapter 21. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he's looking at the other disciples. And do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said... To him, then feed my lambs. Now, Peter said, yes, you know that I love you, but the word that he uses there is not as an extreme type of love that he had before he fell. It's more of a humiliating love. Yes, I love you, <laughs> you know, but I, I really messed up. You know, I, I really denied you, you know, but I, <laughs> deep in my heart, I have this love for you. I know that I was a coward. I know that on the spot I, I said I didn't know you. But deep down, I really, I really do love you. Maybe not like I thought I loved you, but I loved you. Yeah. And Jesus saw that. He saw that in him. And so he asked him to feed. The word is basco, which means grace. 
So take my sheep and I want you to help them to graze the land. Uh, what he's saying here, spiritually speaking, is to graze the word of God, to get them into the word of God. Uh, and he calls them little lambs, the, the Greek word there, my lambs, my little lambs. And so God views us as little lambs, as, as sheep. And the leadership need to come along with sensitivity and understanding to get you out into the pastures and eat, you know, enjoy and 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 get nourished and strengthened from the simple word of God. That's my responsibility. That's Peter's responsibility. He's passing it on to all the pastors of that time to feed. And then he says it again uh, to him again the second time, Son of Jonah, do you love me? And of course he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And the word tend there is different than feed. It means shepherd, which encompasses a little bit more than just taking them out and feeding. You know, I can encourage you to read this word, and I do, please, you should be in it. You know, but you have the responsibility to be in it. It's up to you to open it up and to read a book. If you're like me and you look at it and and, and you go, that's a big book. (laughs) How am I going to read the whole thing? Don't do it that way. You'll never read it. You'll never pick it up. You pick it up and you decide, I want to read a letter. It's just like reading a letter. I like articles. I look at magazines and I like little articles. I, I look at other stuff, I like little articles. I, op- I look at the newspaper and I see a big newspaper with a lot of stuff and I'm going, how am I going to go through all that? So I like to pick out little articles, read little stories and things like that. Even on doctrines and, and, and scriptures, I like little things that are written really quick that just summarize things and you get the idea, you know, and you can walk away with some, some information. And so I approach the book that way. Let, let's just look at, Philemon, 26 verses. That's not a lot. That's a little article. And just open up that little book and just read that little book. You know, and so you're in the Word. And and you're feeding off of it. And you're getting some nourishment, you know. And then you're growing. And you go, wow, that wasn't too bad. I read that whole book. Because you call it a book. You know, I read that whole book. And it's only like a page. You know, then you decide, well, let's go to Jude. It's only, what, 26, 27 verses. Well, I could read Jude, too. And then you go over and, and you say, okay, well, let's go read something like Titus, three chapters, you know. And, and the next thing you know is you've gone through the New Testament. You know, wow, I went through the whole New Testament. You have to do it that way. Let's go to Genesis and just read the book of Genesis. If you're that type of person, if you're a type of person that reads novels, and I know there are those type of people, they just love big novels and they're in it all day long, then read the scriptures, you know, feed on them. Learn from them. Listen to the radio. You're constantly feeding yourself with uh, the scriptures. That's your responsibility. An- another responsibility for pastors is they're the shepherd. Shepherd is different. It's not just feeding, but watching over. You know, you have to watch over them. You take your sheep out to the field. They're grazing, and you're looking all around for for wolves and animals that want to kill the sheep, destroy the sheep, and so forth. You know, and they're out there. Spiritually speaking, there are pastors out there that are not good pastors. There are ministries out there that are not good ministries that only want to take from you your money, just like there is in the world. My mom just recently got a letter in uh, in the mail, and she opened it up, and there was a check for $5,936, something like that. And she was all excited. She looked at it. First thing, she questioned it. No void. It looked real. Watermarks, secured, everything. She calls me up. I just... Got to check, you know, and she's really excited. And it's from Publishers Clearing House. And on the letter it said, I won $2.5 million. And I'm like, what? She goes, I'm serious. This isn't a joke. You know? And so we're going back. It's got to be a scam. So I go over and I look at the check and I'm like, Man, this thing is real. It's got names, everything, signature, watermarks. We'll turn it on the backside where you sign it and where the bank's supposed to, the whole thing. Of course, she calls a guy up because it says to call and let him know that you received it. And he says, oh yeah, go deposit it. And when you deposit, come back and give me a call. Oh, and by the way, don't tell anybody about it. Don't tell anybody about it. And so she told us, because I've always told her, no matter what, you don't give money away. You know who you're giving it to. You let me know, you know, before you do it. And so far, she's always done that when people have called her and asked for money and various things. And sure enough, I called Publishers Clearinghouse and they said it's a scam. It's a scam. They do this. They mail it to you. You go deposit it. And then when you come back and they tell you, don't tell anybody. Don't tell your family. You know, 
Oh, and by the way, you need to send us some cash because we're going to come down and we're going to fly over and we're going to present to you the $2.5 million. So if you can send some cash over so we can start the paperwork. Oh, okay. Preferably cash. Just put an envelope, address it to this place and send it over. And that's how they get you. Now, it's interesting because yesterday at the yard sale, we were talking to a friend of ours that lives a couple of houses down. Same scam with her mom. Her mom gave them $5,000. $5,000. Yeah. They got her for cash at first, and then it was more cash. And they kept saying her, telling her and reminding her, your children are going to be so happy when you pay off their mortgages. They're going to be so happy when you put your grandchildren through college and universities. And they said, but don't tell them because they're going to be a big surprise, $5,000 they took from her. So there are scams out there. There's, a, there's scams even in Christianity, if I can show you this slide. And I don't mean to offend anyone here, and I apologize if I offend you, but these are probably people that you've seen on TV, people that you've heard on TV, people that you've watched on TV. And there's more than just this alone. Than this alone. There's an article that came out in uh, 2000, and um, I think it was 2009, uh, it was with Tilton, who was a faith teacher. We call them faith teachers or um, wealth teachers because they believe that the Bible teaches that, that God wants every man to be wealthy, every man to be healed. And that's not what I read in scriptures, but that's what they believe. And they will pull scriptures out of context and they will get you to give them money. Uh, 2009, a little girl calls and says, um, I need some help because I'm suffering from multiple sclerosis. And so they says, you need to pledge $1,000 and we're going to pray for you and God's going to heal you. And so she actually went to work apparently uh, to raise the money. Uh, she gave them the money and they prayed for her and she waited and she waited and she wasn't healed. So she decided that that she'd call them up and either get more prayer or find out why she wasn't healed. So when she called them up, they basically told her that it's probably sin in your life or that you don't have the faith to do it. And she got so upset and depressed that she went out to her backyard, took a ga gas can, drenched herself and put her on fire and died. Yeah, yeah there's, there's people like this in the church. And that's why we're having a message like this for the church. You have to beware. I personally, this is just my personal opinion. I know it's going to be on, on video and it's going to be on the recording. I personally don't believe that God wants ministers wealthy. I really don't. I think he wants their needs met, but I don't think that he wants them wealthy. They shouldn't be driving around Mercedes. They shouldn't be having big houses. They shouldn't have any of those things. And I'm talking within the Calvary chapels too, by the way. I just don't believe that. I don't see that in Scripture. Well, wait a minute. What about Solomon? Yeah, and look at the ruin of Solomon in the nations. What about David? Yeah, and look at what David did. I think that, that God really wants his ministers to be taken care of by the ministry for a purpose to survive and live and free them up to serve 100% and not worry about the bills and things like that. But they shouldn't have enough that they're buying yachts and they're buying planes and they have mansions and vacation homes and various things. I, I disagree with that completely. The majority of the churches that are out there are around 100 in number. That's the majority. I, I believe God has a purpose for that. I think that's where the real work is being done. I, I think that's where true conversions are happening. When individuals come to churches like this and we're over 100 or so, and, and come here and see the sincerity, see the love, see the hard work, see the struggling, but yet the faith in Christ, they see that it's real, and, and they are converted that way. Compared to going to a huge mega church and going in and out like cattle, you know, and sitting down and leaving and really never experience the inner parts of it. Now, I'm not saying that it can't happen in, in, in the bigger churches, because it is happening in many of the Calvary chapels that are huge churches. Uh, the Lord is working in those churches tremendously and they're reaching all over. And they have the resources. They have the resources to do so. And, and they continue to grow because you have 20,000 people and if 500 of them bring a friend, guess what? You have 500 visitors, right? I mean, just that quick. If 10 of you bring a friend, we only have 10 new visitors, you know? And it's rare to even have people bring a friend. You know? 
and, and sometimes it takes years before someone even brings another friend. Oftentimes we're here because we want to be here and we're not reaching out to others. And so we just come, but we never bring anybody with us. And that's why the churches stay smaller. And usually they come off the streets, uh, unbelievers and so forth. And I really think that the majority of the work is being done at the smaller churches. And you take the smaller churches and you lump them together, it's a huge church. It's called the body of Christ, you know, compared to the mega churches and so forth. So I disagree with that. Well, you already took it off. I disagree, I disagree with that. I disagree that... that Pastors should be owning all of that. And then manipulating the body of Christ and manipulating the elderly with their money, telling them that they have lack of faith or sin in their life, when that is not true at all. We are to shepherd the flock. That is my responsibility as a pastor, to watch out over you, to bring these things up so that you know and are warned that you need to be careful out there. You know, uh, as far as money is concerned, this is the principle that God has given us in His Scripture, 10%. That's it. Just remember that. As long as you remember that, and as some pastors start saying, can you give a 1,000? Can you give some of you 10,000? Can some of you give 5,000? And we really need to work over here, and then he's putting it in his pocket. You know, that's when you need to be careful. No, I can't give you any of that. The Lord said 10%. That's what I'm going to give you. you know, unless he lays it on my heart, you know, I'll, I'll give you more. But that's what the Lord said, 10%. So that's what I'm going to give you. you know. And that pastor has to accept that. Of course, they won't do that. There are churches... You know the people, uh, they're, they're part of the Calvary um, who have gone to places because it's just happening because of what the day and age that we live in who have big churches, but now they're, they're starting to dwindle down and they don't like it. And so they're planning on moving because the numbers are going down. And so they're geared towards numbers and, and big numbers. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why is that? Because of resources? Is it because of money? You know, what's the purpose? Is it even a calling? Pastors that go from place to place until they get a big enough church that can meet their wants and not necessarily their needs. And so they're going place to place and not going to a place where God's called them to go to shepherd the sheep. They're more there to fleece the sheep, take from them as much as they can before they leave to the next place. Um... There are two, two churches in Calvary Chapel that are struggling right now, back east. One of, one of the churches, a guy came out of Harvest, and his church is what's growing, and he's been at the Crusades, you know who he is, uh, and all of a sudden it's not growing, so he's like, I need to get out of here, and move somewhere else. Another guy, you all know him, uh, got involved with Hillsong, and now they're going into the whole uh, charismatic movement you know and they're falling away they're now talking about coughing up demons and things like this all false doctrine you know and it's like you wonder how do they get involved in that because they're not called to shepherd the sheep they're called to fleece they're not they're not to be fleecing they're to be shepherding they're to be tending they're to be watching over them they're to have a love for the sheep themselves Peter's interpreting those scriptures in John chapter 21 and giving it to the elders there <clears throat> within the churches. So, look, just, I'm just like you. We're to tend and we're to feed the sheep. We're to shepherd them together in Christ Jesus and nothing more. Was Peter rich? No. Were any of the apostles well off? No. Let me ask you this. Was Jesus driving around a Mercedes? No. No. He didn't have anything. He said, I got nowhere to even lay my head. See, those are the examples that we need to follow. Did Jesus have a great number following him? Maybe 120. 5,000 that wanted food, but they didn't follow him. He didn't have a great number. The church was small. And it was meant to be small, and it was meant to spread all over Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the whole world. It was never meant to, to boom, bunch up into a mega, mega ministries and so forth. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It does happen, and we see plenty of them out there that are teaching the Word of God and are faithful to it, you know, and so forth. So I'm probably going to get in trouble for all this, but okay. Uh, but I speak it the way I see it, and it's plain, and we see that, don't we, uh, being fleeced. So pastors are all in the same plane, as, as Peter says here. Small, large churches, no matter what it is, no matter what the message is, you know, pastors are the same. Uh, you pinch me, I hurt. If you say something negative against me, guess what? It may hurt me, you know, and my heart will be hurt. My feelings will be hurt and so forth. We sin just like you sin, 
You know, we have pain just like you have pain. We smell just like you smell at times. You know, we're all human beings uh, together. I have just as much time to prepare as the pastor who has 20,000 in his church has to prepare because we all have 24 hours in a day. You know, he just has a lot more resources to take care of with everything else, you know. I kind of like the fact of being involved. I think that's why Chuck stayed involved. I used to watch Chuck even at the pastor's conferences. He'd be in his little golf cart driving around. You see him stop and he'd reach down and he'd pick up a piece of paper and he had a little can. He'd throw it in there. Reach down and pick up little things and throw it in, and he'd go off again. And you know, he was always doing tending the the the, the campus and so forth. And I love. I've always loved that example about him. And that's why I love doing stuff around here. We have our Wednesday mornings, uh, tend the campus. I'm here, I'm raking, I'm cutting grass. You know, I'm pulling weeds just like everybody else. I love that because I love being a part of all that. I love doing that. You know? And I think that's what smaller churches can do is join in together with that uh, sincerity and they see that in the pastor and in the, the ministers that are ministering. And so much so that you have neighbors just, the, just uh, this past Wednesday, uh, Rosemary screamed out hi mariana you know and she says i'll be out of town watch my husband you know make sure he's okay you know and so they've never been to church or anything but they know us you know and they make comments like that it's like you want us to watch your husband yeah he'll be home all day so he, you know he'll hopefully he'll be okay you know and so forth and she's commenting to me she says you're a good pastor i'm like why is that because i see you working pastors don't work you know and it's like Wow, you know, they watch you. And when people watch you and you have that work ethic and you have that, if you don't mind getting dirty, because there's some pastors that don't want to get dirty. They don't want to work. They don't want to do those things. You know, and that's, you watch Christ and he got dirty. You know, he was down there washing their feet. He was down there serving just like uh, anyone else. And that's what pastors need to do. Peter said that he was an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ and that moved him. And only he could say that. He walked with Christ, he lived with Christ, he suffered with Christ also. He understood that just along, along with the other uh, disciples or apostles uh, did. John writes about the same thing in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, the hands we've handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And he's speaking of Jesus Christ. We had first-hand uh, relationship with Jesus. And that's what Peter's saying. We've seen his suffering. We, I was there when they were mocking him and ridiculing him when they put him on trial. I was there when they beat him. I was there when they put the crown of thorns upon him. I was there when he was on the cross. I was there. We were witnesses of those things. I wasn't. I can't say that I was. I can only read it and I can only imagine what it was like at that time. You know, but it happened. And I believe that it happened. And that it revealed the love of God to us that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish and have everlasting life. God didn't just say, believe in me and you'll have life. Can you imagine if he did that? Can you imagine if God just wrote it in a book and just said, look, just believe in me and you will have eternal life. Do you know how many people would believe? Not many. So what did he do? He said, I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to send my son to you. And you are going to abuse him. You're going to mock him and you're going to spit in his face and you're going to put him on a cross, but I'm sending him to die in your place. That's how much I love you. And I want you to believe in him. And I want you to know that I love you that much that I would send you my only begotten son. And when he dies, if you believe in him, you'll have eternal life. He gave us the evidence. He didn't just say it with words. We need the evidence. We need the power. We need the deeds behind that, right? Don't just tell me you love me. Show me you love me. Show me you care about me. Show me you believe in me. And that's what James is all about, right? A, a, it's a book of works because faith without works is dead. And if you're saying I have faith and yet you have no works, you're dead. You're lying. The truth's not in you. You have to have works. You have to show God that you love him by your actions. So he says, I... I suffered with him, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Uh, that's the best part of being a, an elder, of being a servant of Christ, is we get to partake of his glory in the end. We're, we're uh, in a sense, we're working together. The word there, um, partaker, means common or shared by. And so we're sharing with Christ the sufferings and the glory of Christ with him. What a great privilege that we can partake of God's glory 
together with him. Paul said, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine there. You know, there's, there's a glory there as we partake with him. The Septuagint translates it companionship. There's a companionship with Christ uh, when we serve together and then when we receive that glory. And Peter partook of the glory of God. He had that experience at the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there. And then all of a sudden a great light and Jesus was white as snow and the Father spoke. He's like, wow, that's the glory of God. And he partook of that glory. And that's the glory that one day we'll also partake of. Now we come to verse 2 and... Should I stop or should I go? There is so much here, people. Give me... Let me stop. I have to stop. And I, I think you understand why, those of you that, that know. We need to understand the responsibility here. There's so much out there. He's going to instruct the elders. You need to know what that instruction is so that you know what to expect you know, from them and when you see good elders. You know, when, when we choose elders, um, we don't choose them. God chooses them. What do you mean by that? God tell you or what? No, we watch what they do. We watch how they're serving. We, we watch the commitment. You know, we watch the faithfulness uh, that only comes natural because God has equipped them. And when that happens, we say, boy, that person would make a good elder. You know, they're wonderful. If someone comes in here and, and says, hey, I'd like, you to, like to build you a, a, a bench. Okay, <laughs> you know, what's this bench going to look like when you're done? You know, that's my question. And so we're like, okay, go ahead. And, and all of a sudden he's done with it and we're like, Wow. You can sit down and you're comfortable. It's got this little, little, little seat that's just bent, you know, and it's got sides with just beautiful corbel cuttings, you know, and it's painted. And you're going, that's a nice bench. It's like, wow. And you're thinking, that guy's got a gift. Let's use him to build other stuff, right? You know, he has the gift. We acknowledge the gift. We've seen the gift. And so let's just use him in that gift. And that's how we choose elders, is that when they come here, they just, can I, help in any way? Sure. Can you just sweep out there? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Well, okay, so he can serve. Can you just, you know, help over in this? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do that. Can you be here at this time? Yeah, I'll be there on time. Yeah, I'll be there. You know, they're, they're committed. They're there. They're serving. They have no problem. You know, someone comes up and says, I'm feeling bad. You know, is the pastor here? No, not really. He says, well, can I pray for you? Yeah, can you pray for me? Yeah, let's pray. And he's praying for people. And you start seeing this thing flowing and you realize, I guy make a good elder. He serves, he prays for people, he's committed, he's here. You know, yeah, let's make him an elder. God has already done it, and let's agree with God that he's an elder. And so we raise them up, and there's qualifications for that elders that was, as we read, and now instruction for those elders. You can't force it, guys. It's got to come natural. There's a hunger in your heart to serve God's people, to shepherd and to tend the sheep of God. It's a beautiful thing. I really enjoy it even through the heartaches and the pains and the sufferings, and even through the joy. Yesterday was such a joy to see everyone working. It was beautiful to see everybody, you know, in the kitchen, the ladies cooking and, and, and fellowshipping together, and then everyone on the outside screaming and yelling, and, you know, it's just, it was just fun. I love stuff like that. That's what creates relationships and good fellowship and, and a solid foundations within the church. To go to a place that's huge and sit and then just leave doesn't do anything for you. It just doesn't. It doesn't for me. But it does for 20,000 people. Does it really? How's their household? Where's their commitment to the Lord really? Why isn't our world changing? <clears throat> you know, why aren't these people voting? I think there's more people percentage-wise voting in a smaller church than in a bigger church, I guarantee you, percentage-wise. There's more people serving in a smaller church than in the bigger church churches i'll guarantee you most of us here serve you know that this church <clears throat> the men are the majority of the servers and in many churches it's oftentimes the women that are serving and so it's a blessing to see more men involved than women involved and we have more percentage wise probably somewhere like 20 to 30 percent of the people involved in one form or another in serving you get in the smaller churches and it's more like nine to ten percent of the churches so they got a lot to choose from they got a lot of resources you know and that's wonderful but the commitment of people itself so 
So we're blessed to have this beautiful church here. I'm blessed to be a part of it.